Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Which is our way of saying welcome to church. My church is a group of people who are like family, helping others move from circles of despair to circles of hope, life, and fulfillment in God. My church is a place that inspires dreams and encourages the next generation. Church is my happy place. My church is where I can grow in my relationship with God. If you need love, welcome home. If you need hope, welcome home. If you need a place to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. No matter who you are or where you find yourself, we're praying this service encourages you where you're at. Welcome home. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning, or you might be watching later on in the day. We're about to go into a time of praise and worship, and I, I wanted to encourage you from a scripture in Philippians 4. It says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to worship God. And I pray that as we do, a peace that surpasses all understanding would guard our hearts, would guard our minds through Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.
And there's a simplicity, humility to the way you love me, and honesty, a purity. God, you make it easy. No special words or formulas could ever win you over, for your love is undeserved. And even when I can't see clearly, somehow you still make it easy. Your love's uncomplicated. You love me just the way I am. So I stand before you. I'm totally surrendered with open hands and open heart. Jesus, have your You see my deepest thoughts, my hidden walls. God, you see right through me, even when I'm overthinking. Somehow you still love me simply. Your love's uncomplicated. You love me just the way. Just before we started worship, Fadila referenced a Bible verse, Philippians 4, 6, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. 
Paul is saying, don't worry about anything. If there is something that is causing you to worry or be anxious, talk to God about it. And the verse goes on to say that the peace of God, which is greater than you can ever understand, will guard and protect your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One of the things I love about prayer is that it's not just an individual shopping list, but it is a way for us to join in community with the Trinity and join in community with each other. Prayer can be an intercessory moment where we get a chance to stand in the gap in what people are experiencing and know the new life that is promised us in Jesus's death and his resurrection. Prayer is a, is a chance for us to shift our focus from ourselves and onto God, but also from our self-centeredness onto the needs of other people. I love what Richard Foster says about intercession. He says, he says that when we love people, that we will want more for them than we are able to give them in and of ourselves. And that leads us to humility and that leads us to God in prayer. Intercession is a way that we can truly express love and demonstrate love to other people. Um, there are people this week that have sent us their prayer requests from all over the UK, exactly because they want us to stand in prayer with them. We've got someone who's praying for their final year at university, for guidance post-graduation, another person who's praying for healing, for pain in their chest and their neck and their shoulders. Um, we've also got a prayer request here for a cure for lupus, another person who's praying for their brother and their sister-in-law who are going through a difficult time with mental health issues and depression. We've got another person in desperate need for a place to live and for financial provision. And another request here for employment doors to be open. So we're going to stand in prayer today. Lord, we thank you for the gathering of your people. No matter where we find ourselves, in bed, in our living rooms, with family or alone, Lord, we know that you care for the things that are causing us to worry and to be anxious. So today we submit it all to you, Lord, and we pray that you will have your mighty way in our lives. We declare healing for physical and mental pain. We declare provision and restoration in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So stay in this moment. We're going to continue to worship and praise God for all that He's doing in our lives.
Amen. One of the things that people often pray for is for their friends and their family to come to know Jesus and accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. We have been afforded a unique opportunity this past year to, for the first time, I think in the history of our church, run the Alpha Course, which is a really safe space for people to come and ask questions and to learn about Jesus. We have finished that course. Yeah. And I sat down with a few people who were in it and who ran it just to kind of get their feedback on it, um, just to show you what took place, what to expect. And when we run it again in the future, maybe you want to be a part of it. Maybe you'll feel comfortable inviting your friends and family along. Family along. So check this out. We are now joined with Coco and Ola. What made you want to get involved with Alpha? So Robbie, about 20 years ago, I, I did Alpha and I loved the experience. So when the opportunity came to say, we'll be running Alpha in the church, I'm like, absolutely. How did you see the people in your group go, uh, grow as, uh, as you did Alpha for those number of weeks? So we have a group we saw uh, like everybody is so is such a different stages of, their, of journey. their journey with Christ and seeing you know the uh, probably the more mature Christian pouring in to the new Christians who have so many questions and feeling like nobody is judging them or nobody is better yeah but really um, helping and supporting each other and seeing people really becoming like um, vulnerable, um, you know, sharing about their personal life, their, their experiences, their struggles. Yeah. Mm. Um, this is this is just beautiful to see. I feel like everybody in the Connect group came out new. Absolutely. You know, with Absolutely. like a different perspective of Christ. Yeah. Um, different per perspective of their faith and yes. their journey. Hey, we have Tim and Justine here uh, who have done Alpha recently. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we good. Thank you so much for having us. What were some of the new revelations you, you took away? For me, I think it's the Holy Spirit is truly here with us. I've never experienced the Holy Spirit the way that I have. Both of us, Both for of that us. matter. Yeah. So speaking personally, lockdown has had us in quite a tricky situation where Justine's had an amazing job which financially has provided for us for the past, I don't know, over a year. I am a filmmaker and photographer and so our industry has very much slowed down and so I haven't had that income stream. And so I have in many senses given up on myself and then getting into Alpha, my personal takeaway and this is something hard to admit because I've been a Christian for a long time, yet have never needed to rely on God as a friend wow. and God as a provider. Wow. And so Justine going to work leaves me home alone a lot of the time. And being alone, you get caught up in your own head. And so learning these basic truths about God that we should all know I've known this stuff, yeah. but actually I've never known this stuff until now mm. God brought us here to be alone, away from financial support for us or, and for me. Yeah. It's been a very much a personal journey. We are joined now with Heron and Sarajni from Sidcup at our Kent campus. What was it that drew you to Alpha? What made you want to get involved in it? Well, Alpha has been very close to our hearts. Um, because I think uh, both of us, uh, we came to faith. Uh, this was about 21 years ago through Alpha. And we, we witnessed so many people come to the Lord through Alpha. So, yeah. Including some of our family members back then. So I, I think when lockdown, lockdown happened, uh, we really had this burden to do the Alpha course in some shape or form here. Um, because we knew people were hurting and this was an ideal opportunity just to reach out. Alpha is for anyone. Uh, it can be for people who are just uh, curious, seeking, new to faith, been a Christian for many years. There's something in it for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the safe space and uh, the friendships and the group dynamics, the way things work, it's an ideal platform to bring people, help people in their journey uh, 
finding finding their faith. Thank you for running it and and for 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 doing all that you did. Honestly, it, it made such a difference for people. So there you go. Those are just some of the many stories that we've heard from all from people all around the UK who have ran Alpha and have absolutely loved it. You ran Alpha. I did run. First Alpha. time running it. Yeah. How did it go? It was great. One of the things I really loved was the bonds that you could see people forming yeah. as the weeks went on. Yeah. You could just tell it was a safe space. They could come and ask any questions they wanted to. Yeah. And one of the things I really loved was at the end, you could tell they didn't want it to end. Yeah, and great. they were all like, I wish we could keep this going for you know more weeks. And I was like, you can, just join a group. But yeah, no, it was really great. Awesome, awesome, yeah. great. Well, speaking of great and having a great time, we're gonna come around our giving. We've got mm -hmm. Sarah Morgan from our Liverpool location standing yeah. by, so over to you, Sarah. <laughs> Good morning, church. I'm Sarah and I'm coming to you from Hillsong, Liverpool. Big shout out to everybody watching today from our Hillsong, Liverpool campus. I know we have people right across the Northwest and into Manchester. And um, I also want to say a big good morning to all the guys from Birmingham. And I'm so glad that you're watching with us this morning. So we're going to come around our tithes and our offerings today. And I want to ask you a question. What is your source? I'm not talking about your favorite sauce like ketchup or brown sauce, but what is your sauce? This is something that I I found myself really challenged on a little while ago, just this idea of our source and our supply. Who is our supply? And um, we were praying for something personally in our lives, believing for God to um, just come through and we needed God to provide, to open up an area in our lives. And um, we waited weeks, we waited months, you know, time went by. And finally, that answer did come in our lives. And when the answer came, we found ourselves being a bit like, oh, it's about time and gosh, we really have worked hard for that and in that moment I found myself challenged just to remember that actually hang on a minute we prayed for this and God has provided God is our source God is our supply I think this idea of trust and trusting God is a really big theme that runs all through the Bible I love the book of Deuteronomy and I know in Deuteronomy God is trying to teach the people of God the children of God who are in the desert wandering in the desert he's trying to teach them to look to to God as their supply, as their source, that He has everything that they need to sustain them, to provide for them. He has the best for them, but He wants them to look to Him, to trust that He is their God who is going to provide all of their needs. So I'm going to read a verse for you um, from Deuteronomy 8.18. It says in the Bible, it says, but remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I think this is so relevant for us in our lives when it comes to the area of, of our tithes and our offering, of our giving. God is our source, that God is our supply. He's the one that gives us the ability to, um, to create wealth in our lives. And um, there's two really practical things in my life over the years that I found that has really helped me to um, stay remembering that God is our provider, that He is our source um, where our provision comes from. And the first thing is this, prayer. You'll know how dependent you are on God by how much you pray and how much prayer is a priority in our lives. The Bible teaches us to bring our needs before God, to bring our requests to Him, to let to make them known to Him. He wants to provide in our lives, but we've got to be, bring ourselves in prayer to Him. And the second thing is um, this area of giving. I found that over the years when I prioritize giving, when I prioritize bringing my tithes and offerings, we're a church that believes in bringing our tithes and offerings into the house of the Lord. When I, when I do this, it keeps me remembering that God is my supplier, that He gives um, wealth in our lives, that He gives provision in our life, and, um, and he, he provides for us, so we need to acknowledge that, but He is able to provide for the future as well. And um, we're not on our own, but God is our provider. And bringing our tithes and our offerings to the Lord keeps us reminded to look to Him as our source and as our supplier. So today, as we come around our giving, all the different ways that you can give are going to come up on the screen in front of me. And um, I just want to thank you for giving today as a pastor in the life of our church. Um, we just are so grateful for you for faithfully giving. And um, we know that it means a big, a big deal what we can do um, in terms of this season, moving back into services. Um, we just thank you for, for giving today. And I want to take a moment just to pray for you and pray for your family and God's blessing over your life as you give today. So let's pray. 
Lord, we just thank you today, God, for your people, God. We thank you, Lord, that you are our source, that you are our supplier, God. And Lord, today we look to you, God, to provide in our lives, God. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you have um, a store for your people today, Lord. So we bring before you these amazing people, God, and we thank you, Lord, for your blessing over their lives, God. We pray that you would supply for their need, God, as they give today faithfully into your house, God. I thank you, Lord, that you will supply their need. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, church. We'll have an amazing rest of the service. How wonderful was it to hear from the beautiful Sarah in Liverpool. Now talking about wonderful things, the Douglas clan has finally arrived here in the UK. Yes, we might be stuck within these four walls, but we are here and healthy, two negative COVID tests down. So we are honestly so thrilled to be here. I think it was so long we were like, we're coming, we'll be there soon, but we are finally here. And honestly, we could not be more excited to get out of quarantine and to see your faces and to start this beautiful new season and chapter together. Also, can I just say a huge thank you because your kindness has been overwhelming. So many beautiful messages, so many Instagram direct messages as well, but you have been so kind, generous with your words and so welcoming. So thank you very much. I'm a very blessed pastor, I have to say. But I'm here to do a job this morning and I get the absolute privilege of introducing our guest speaker. To be honest, she is not a guest. She is part of the family. And Christine Kane, the Wonder Woman herself, is the most phenomenal preacher of the Word of God. You know and love her here in the UK. She comes every single year without fail. And I know she cannot wait to be here when COVID restrictions lift. But what an amazing opportunity for us to be under the Word of God. And I don't know about you, but every time I have heard Christine Kane speak, I have left empowered and encouraged and inspired and knowing that my God is for me. And if He is for me, who and what can stand against me? And so I just pray this morning as we open up our hearts and our minds to receive the Word of God, that we would just be receptive to the Holy Spirit because He is in every room, on the train, wherever you are, He is there and He wants to speak into your hearts, to give strength to the weary, to lift up our heads, to instill us with courage and hope and to maybe give fresh, fresh vision. And so I'm very excited to hear from the beautiful Christine Kane this morning. And I know this message is going to bless you. Hey church, it's Chris here. How are you doing? I'm so fired up to be with you all today. I miss London so desperately. And I'm telling you, as soon as I can, I'm going to jump on a plane. I am going to be there personally with you all. But I am so excited about Pastor Tim and Nicola taking the vision of our church forward. And we've been friends for so many years. And I just feel so privileged that they invited me to join you all today. I know that I'm speaking to you all over London and beyond in all of your living rooms and lounge rooms. Some of you are on the treadmill. Some of you still having breakfast but I am so fired up to be with you honestly you better be careful when I come and we all gather I'm going to be hugging you all so so dramatically I have never not seen you in the flesh this much since almost the church started so Nick and I have come over so many times each year and you know what? I just really, really miss you. But I'm going to dive into the word. I believe I've got a word from the Lord for you today. And um, we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 26. Now, don't get nervous. I'm going right to the first chapter of the Bible. And if you stick with me today, you know, we're going to go right through to Revelation. You're going to be shocked what we could do in just a day. But in Genesis uh, 26 verses 1 to 22, there's a lot of scripture. It says, Now there was a famine in the land besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Don't go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. So journey in this land and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all of these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all of these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerat when the men of the place 
asked him about his wife. He said, she is my sister. Guys, don't do this. I'm just giving you a warning. For he feared to say my wife thinking, lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of the window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this that you've done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled the earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again, I want you to catch that, dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servant dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna and he moved from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth saying, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. Okay, I love this portion of scripture. And today, if you're wondering, Chris, you've dropped into us here at our London church. What is it that you're going to speak to us about? I'm going to speak to us about it's time for us to grab a shovel and start digging. Now, okay, this is the best that I could do at short notice, but I want you to have this imagery. Now, Isaac, of course, is one of the, the patriarchs. And this is the only chapter in scripture that's entirely dedicated to Isaac in all of the scripture. So Abraham had 14 chapters that were dedicated to his life and, and Jacob had 11 chapters that were dedicated to his life. And what was happening? Isaac was on his way to Egypt and God told him that he would bless him in the land of the famine. So of course we see that God blesses Isaac. King Abimelech told him to, to leave because he had feared his strength. And the wells, as he was leaving, the wells were filled with dirt. Now, you got to understand, in a desert, a well becomes a lifeline for the entire community. Wells are essential for the lives of the families and all of the flock. And when a new well was dug in an unoccupied area, it was named and the surrounding area was claimed. And, and what it did was it denoted ownership. So after Abraham's death, the Philistines plugged the wells because they wanted to ruin them for future use so no one else could get water out of them. They did not want any claim on their land, so, so they filled all of the wells because this was an asset of great value and they didn't want anyone to come and take their land. So Isaac, and what we read in this passage of scripture is that Isaac had to get a shovel and he had to get down and he had to re-dig the wells. So what Isaac and, and his men had to do was they had to remove all of the garbage to make the wells fresh again. So once the well was cleared and the water would be able to start flowing again and of course be a lifeline and provide refreshment. So once the well was cleared, it would start to flow again. And so what Isaac had to do, he had to rediscover where the wells were and he had to begin to dig those wells. So for you and I, I believe this is a time where, where we have to pick up a shovel and we have to dig. And you go, Chris, why are you even talking about wells? And what does the story of Isaac have got to do with us right here in London today? So I simply want you to see this as a, a metaphor. I want you to see this as a metaphor. It's, it, it's a matter of imagery that we find in Isaac. And I see in his experience a picture that might help all of us as we lay a hold of everything that God has for you and for me in Christ Jesus. See, in John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus said, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus, he actually stood up at that time and he cried out. He said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So whoever believes in me, 
as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So of course, Jesus in John was talking about spiritual, not physical thirst. And what we need to do is we need to come to Jesus himself, who is our living water. Jesus himself is the source of eternal life. Only Jesus Christ himself can satisfy. People will never satisfy us, places or things. And I think this whole year in quarantine, we've come to a, a whole nother level where we're remembering that, you know what? Jesus is my source. Jesus is the one that actually sustains me. He is the source of my peace. He is the source, source of my joy. He is the source of my hope. And Jesus said, out of you will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus is the source, but out of us will flow rivers of living water. You and I, we are carriers of the Spirit of God and out of us living water will flow. And I believe God is preparing us for the greatest revival that we have ever seen throughout all of the UK. And there's been some great revivals, but you and I are carriers of the revival that we are looking for. We are carriers of the presence of God and we are called to influence the world around us. So my question today, church, how much of His Spirit is flowing through you so that you can impact the world around you? And a lot of us can feel a little bit dry. I mean, we've just come out of the most challenging year that we've probably ever had in our lifetime. So I wanna ask you today, how is your heart? This Living water has to flow through us into a lost and a broken world. So if our well is dry or polluted or toxic, then guess what? Everything around us is impacted. What we need to do is we need to get rid of the things that have caused the wells to be plugged up. We have to get honest about the condition of our hearts. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to come in and unclog our hearts. I think the interesting thing is that we read from this text is that old wells can still produce fresh water. You see, Isaac dug the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and he named them, the Bible says in verse 19, the names that his father had given them. So the first thing Isaac did was to redig and rename the wells that still had water, wells that had been dug by his father. You know, as we move into the new thing that God is doing, I want us to remember that not everything that has gone before us has been polluted with, with legalism or judgment or lovelessness. Sometimes I say to my, my kids who are just so enthusiastic about the way forward for the church, I'm going, hey, not everything that went before was actually obsolete. Not everything is irrelevant. What we need to do in order to move forward, and I believe we're moving forward, is we need to reopen and redig some old wells. We need to redig a source of spiritual vitality for us. And basically, that is what we're going to take to a lost and a broken world. You know, after 30 years, my life has changed so much in so many ways. I've been serving our church for, for almost 33 years. And the fact is, lots of things have changed. Methodology changes, style changes, relevance changes. But there are some things that will never change because these are the water supplies that keep us going. And we need to redig the, the well of the word. Nothing will ever replace the word of God, the foundation that we build our life on, the well of prayer, the well of church and committed to our local community, the well of fasting, the well of evangelism, the well of justice, the, the well of holiness, the well of righteousness the well of healing and the well of forgiveness. I wonder, would you be willing to redig these wells for the next generation? The very life source and foundation. Are we willing to redig it? It's been a tough year. We've been challenged to the core. But the truth is that there are wells that are worthy of redigging because they've still got a whole lot of water in them. You know, and there is no doubt we're in a new season as a church. We're, we're moving into, into new ground. I'm so excited about what's coming ahead. And we've got to understand that new wells are dug for a new thing. You see, the scripture says that Isaac dug new wells. So 
Isaac dug his own new wells and he found running water in them. In every generation and in every season, there are new wells that must be dug. And so we take what we can from the old wells, but then there are always new wells that need to be dug. So it will take intentional effort for us as we move forward into the new thing that God's doing to dig new wells. Now, the scripture tells us that the Lord says that remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. And God says, behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water. I want you to hear this in Isaiah 43, 18 to 21. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. I want you to know you might be feeling you're in a desert or in a wilderness season right now. But there's living water for you in that season. What had happened in the book of Isaiah was that the Israelites had been living out a 70 year sentence of exile in Babylon and they felt that they had no future. And God reminded them that he'd freed them from slavery in Egypt. He had split the Red Sea. He had provided manna from heaven. He kept them alive. And he reminded them that as he was faithful in the past, he would be faithful now. The new thing that he was going to do would eclipse the old thing that he had done. Church, that's a word for us. God was faithful to us in the past. God will continue to be faithful to us now. And the new thing he's going to do is going to eclipse anything that's ever gone before. How God did it in the past is not the only way that he's ever going to do it. So we learn from the past, but we don't live in it. God is doing a new thing in your generation for your generation. And in Matthew 9, 17, Jesus says, you cannot put new wine into old wine skin or it's going to compromise the integrity of both. So the new wells, and I believe as we move forward, and when I say church, I'm talking the global church, capital C. I believe that the new wells that are being dug in our generation, and when you look at what's happened on the earth over this last year, I think this will resonate resonate in your heart. There there were wells that was kind of kept us all separate in the past. But the new wells, the new wells are not either or, they're both and. I think throughout Christian history, you know, the rise of of all different denominations and all different churches around the place, we've had sort of this either or approach. But I think what the Lord's doing as we move forward is is a both and. So, Is it faith or works? Well, it's not either or, it's both and, it's faith and works. Is God using male and female? I thank God in our church, this has never been an issue, but it's both male and female. Is God interested in spirit or truth? Well, it's not either or. We're going to worship him in spirit and truth. Does God use young people or old people? Well, it's not either or, it's young and old. Okay, do we need skill? To build the church or do we need zeal? Well, it's not either or. We need skill and zeal. Okay, should our churches coming out of a pandemic, should they be attractional or should they be missional? Well, both. Attractional and missional. Should we be concerned with evangelism and reaching the lost or social justice? Well, two sides of the same coin. Both. What's more important, the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit? Well, it's not either or. It's both. Does God, is God a God of grace or does He require our obedience? Well, both what's more important preaching or teaching both you know do we need to focus on theology or practical application both does god care about the heart or the head both does god care about this earth or the new earth both is it all about counseling or deliverance both does god use medicine or divine healing both Is it about discipleship or outreach? Both. Does God care about like traditional churches or contemporary churches? He uses both. Does God care about holiness or relevance? Both. Is it about prayer or is it about action? Both. See, historically church, and so much of the divisiveness and chaos around the world and and sometimes unfortunately even between denominations and churches and streams, We've used these things to keep us apart. And sometimes even in church life, you go, I like this emphasis instead of that emphasis. And God's saying it's not either or, it's both and. 
We're one body, many parts. We need all of this to build a dynamic, vibrant, life-giving, transformative church. So what happens is you've got to understand, and according to the text, when you start digging new wells, you will encounter resistance. I mean, the enemy does not want the church to take ground. He doesn't want you to take ground in your own life. And when you say, God, I'm going to dig deep because I want rivers of living water to flow from me into a lost and a broken world. God, I want to be part of the new thing that you're doing. Well, let me just say you will encounter resistance. You see, where there is spiritual progress, you can expect resistance from the enemy. We do have an enemy. And Isaac dug wells, but he was fought every single step of the way. We see right here in, in Genesis chapter 26, verse 19, he, he called that first well Essek because it was a place of strife and arguments. And then in verse 21, Sitna, because it was a place of contention and accusation. Does this sound like the world today? A place of strife and arguments, a place of contention and accusation. And of course, in 26, 22, he calls it Rehoboth, which is wide open spaces. So Isaac did not stay in those places of strife and contention. What he did was he went and he found new wells. So what am I saying? I'm saying, you know, I think we've had a lot of time on our hands during this lockdown and it's amazing what has happened online and the chaos and the divisiveness. You just see it all around the world. I mean, they, so many newspaper articles, you know, call it the, the, the time of outrage. It's just unbelievable what's happened in our world. But dare I say, church, that this is not a time for us to stop at the well of contention and strife and arguing. You know, what happens is I believe we as the church, this is not a time to say, man, what do I do? I'm on this right side or I'm on this left side. This is not a time to go further. It's a time to go deeper. This is where we start digging wells, wells of the heart. You know, we see the restoration, obviously. If we get to the end of that, te that text, we see that Isaac's enemies appeared and they asked him for his forgiveness and blessing. See, they reached a place of, of peace and truce because new wells were dug. So the fact is the enemy does not want you to pick up a shovel and start digging. See, this is a season of how we're going to go further by digging deeper by allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work in our heart so that rivers of living water will flow from us. That like Isaac, we're going to dig up some of the living water that's in old wells and then we're going to go and in the new season find new wells and they're not going to be contentious and they're not going to be either or they're going to be both and. But there will be enemies of digging because here's the bottom line, man. Digging is hard. Digging is messy. Digging is unspectacular. It's boring. It's repetitive, it goes unnoticed, and it's largely unapplauded. So most people don't dig because it's flat out hard work to pick up a shovel and start digging. And you're thinking, here I am in this season as we, we enter into a whole new season of Hillsong London. I'm saying, church, we've got to pick up a shovel and dig. And the en enemy's going to do everything he can to stop you from digging for your generation. So I think one of the reasons we don't pick up a shovel and we don't start digging is because a lot of us, we have FOMO. Now, you know what that is, the, the big thing in the 21st century. FOMO is fear of missing out. And I think it's an, it's, it's an anxiety um, that, it, that an exciting or an interesting event somewhere else is going to be happening. And and I'm not there. So what happens is you, you see it on social media and it's, you're like, everybody else is at the party, I'm not. Or everybody else is in that conversation and I'm not. So what our generation has done is we spend our life like refreshing our feeds constantly to make sure that we're not missing out on anything. And you know, FOMO is not a new thing. It started in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter three, verse five. You know, when the enemy came in and he talked to Eve and he said, you know, eat from the one forbidden tree, Eve, and you're going to be like God. So Eve thought she might be missing out on something. God had given her everything. And she thought I might be missing out on something. So there is the origin of FOMO. It's not just with the advent of social media. What FOMO does is it feeds on scarcity and of time. You know, man, we think if I miss this moment, I'm never going to have another moment. And our fear of missing out, church, 
is keeping us looking at everyone else's lives and we're not living the life that God has called us to live. So what are we doing? So often we are scrolling and we're not digging. We're, we're talking and we're not digging. We're posting, but we're not digging. We're liking posts, but we're not digging. We're comparing, but we're not digging. We're competing, but we're not digging. We're, we're watching or criticizing or arguing or avoiding and not digging. Maybe we're playing or escaping or hiding, but we're doing anything but picking up a shovel and digging. So the fact is, if you and I fix our eyes on our phones, how are we ever going to find the new thing that God is doing? You see, you and I were not created to compare our lives for the likes of people. It's killing us. If we are in Christ, we should have no FOMO. Why should we have no FOMO? I want to remind you of that today, church, because as long as we have Jesus, church, we miss nothing. The Bible says in Psalm 16 too, that there is no good apart from God. Psalm 16, 11 says in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. Ephesians 1, 3 says we've got every spiritual blessing in him. Ephesians 2, 6 says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You see, we've got it all in him. What we have to do is keep digging so the junk comes out of our hearts and the life of Christ and everything we have in him flows through us. You know, I do think that we should have a degree of FOMO, but the fact is God has hardwired FOMO into our hearts. We, we should have a, a godly FOMO, okay? Because I just said that we, we shouldn't have FOMO. We shouldn't have FOMO about what everyone else is doing and what I might be missing out of. But we should have a godly fear of missing out on everything that God has for us. You see, you and I are so obsessed often with the here and now that we're forgetting what we are here for now. You know, I, I do have FOMO. I have FOMO of missing the good works that God has prepared for me to do. I have FOMO of missing out on my eternal rewards. I have FOMO of hearing when I get to the other side, well done, what if I don't, good and faithful servant. I have FOMO that I might not have crowns to cast at his feet. I might have FOMO that that I'm missing out on the abundant life that Jesus came to give me. FOMO that I'm missing out on his presence with me in my daily pursuits. I'm missing out that maybe he was with me and I didn't even know it. I'm missing out on being ready when he returns. I'm missing out on making his last commandment my first priority. I'm missing out on this being my time such as this because it's the only time that I've got or becoming holy as he is holy or missing out on the things that I'm supposed to seek first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, or missing out on co-laboring with him to change the world. So there's a kind of FOMO we should never have because that stops us from getting on with our purpose. That stops us from digging. That stops us from pursuing the purpose that God has for us. And then there's a FOMO that we should have. That's the FOMO that drives us to be all that God's called us to be, to do all that God's called us to do, to get to the other side and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. See, there's no just cruise control this side of eternity, church. We're going to pick up some shovels and we've got to start digging. See, what happens is, you know, the, the most important scripture in the New Testament about discipleship is when Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, he said, and he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and daily, daily, and follow me. You see, the fact is when we spend our life with a fear of missing out, what happens is we don't commit ourselves wholeheartedly to what God has for our life. So Jesus invites us, according to that text, into an all-in life, a whole skin in the game kind of Christian life of discipleship. Every aspect of our life, and you can't be all in if you keep some out. So to truly follow Jesus, we've got to cut off all other options. But you know, it's hard because we're the options generation. And, and we have commitment phobia because we don't want to miss out. So we have so many choices when it comes to dating or food or entertainment, jobs, churches, services. We don't want to pick up a shovel and start digging because we think, what if something better comes along? 
Now at some point, church, you have to decide to pick up a shovel and start digging right where you are with what you have. And we've a year into this pandemic and everyone's at different stages of lockdown and opening. And I know it's tougher for you guys over there in London. But the deal is right here, right now, are we willing to pick up a shovel? You know, my whole life, I've only ever picked up a shovel wherever I was and started digging wherever I was. I mean, I came to our church in 1989 and I started volunteering in our youth ministry and I started serving at our community-based youth center. I had no idea where that would lead me. In 1989, there was even no internet. 1990 was when the World Wide Web came and the World Wide, we weren't on it. But Hills District Youth Service led to me serving in Youth Alive. It, it led to equip and empower and serving churches around the world, which then led to A21, which is now in 15 countries around the world. And can I just tell you, church, that we have seen more people rescued during this global pandemic than in the history of A21. We have got more people, more survivors in our aftercare facilities, in our freedom centers than ever before. That is a miracle of God during a global pandemic and all of the other things that I have done. But the fact is I could never have mapped that life out for myself. You see, it's a, a calling and not a career to follow Jesus. So we get to the place we want to get to there by being faithful here and picking up a shovel here. If we try to work this out after all of the ramifications of this global pandemic, and we think the economic ramifications, our career ramifications, it would be easy to lose heart and think somehow God has lost sort of purpose for our lives. But I'm here to tell you that if you make a commitment to dig now, allow the Holy Spirit to go deep that you'll be preparing yourself for what God has already prepared for you. You know, we actually don't have skin in the game until we start digging. You know, we are here and there's a, I, I remember, and you know, this, this would be an old example, but in the year 2000, when Nick and I went to the Sydney Olympic Games, it was so awesome because it was all so new, 21 years ago, 116,000 spectators in the grandstand. And then there was, only eight runners running the 100 metre final. Because there's always 116,000 people in the grandstand and eight that are on the field. Because it takes a different commitment level to actually get on the field to run your race and to finish your course. There'll always be more spectators than participators. But I wonder whether you'd be willing as we go forward as a church to pick up a shovel and start digging. As a participator in the Christian journey, I wanna remind you, church, Christianity is not a spectator sport. The only option that Jesus Christ gives us as followers of Him, as disciples of Jesus, is an all-in life. Do you remember the Hebrews 11 cloud of witnesses? Well, they all had skin in the game. They all died brutal deaths so that you and I can be hearing this word today and find life in Christ. Remember, John and the Baptist obviously had skin in the game, cost him his head. Paul, the apostle, had skin in the game. He lost his head too. Stephen had skin in the game. He was, he was stoned to death and martyred for his faith. The apostles had skin in the game, apart from Judas and James, the son of Zebedee. Legend has it that Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified. Paul was beheaded. Matthew and Thomas were stabbed to death with swords. James was stoned and clubbed to death. Matthias and Andrew were burnt to death. John died of old age after being cast into like boiling oil in Rome. Jesus Christ himself certainly had skin in the game. He gave his life on the cross at Calvary so that you and I can have forgiveness for our past, a fresh start today and a hope for the future. Jesus gave his all and he wants us to give our all to him. You know, I think another reason we don't pick up a shovel and dig is because digging takes a lot of time and we don't like to wait for anything in our generation. Man, if a video takes more than two seconds to upload on our phones, we just leave it. You know, we get news on demand at the, at the touch of an app. I mean, with Amazon Prime, we can get groceries at the, at the touch of an app. Uber is going to turn up and take us wherever we want to go when we're allowed to get back out again. Electric scooters are, are right there for us. And you know what? Our world, basically, it just favors the short term. Our financial markets think in seconds. Our 
Magazines and fashion industry think in terms of seasons and business leaders think about the next quarter. Politicians think about the next term in office. We're obsessed with having everything now and it's driving our FOMO. And yet in the scripture, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 12, the Bible says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Church, we're on a journey. And the way we're going to inherit the promise that God has for us takes two things, faith and patience. I'm here to tell you faith is not enough. We need patience. Digging wells does not happen overnight. Faith is unbelieving God. Patience is the capacity to tolerate the delay, the ability to wait. I am drinking, drinking from wells in my 50s and, and Tim, who's known me a, a really long time, would testify to this and Nicola, that I'm drinking from wells in my 50s that I actually dug in my 20s. Actually, Pastor Tim and Nicola, by coming and leading this next season of our church, this is part of a well that they dug. And so you don't know what God's got for you in the future. So make sure you're digging now because you don't even know if the water from the well that you're digging now is going to provide for you somewhere in the future. And so church, let's not stop digging new wells for what God has for us in the future. Remember, it's going to take faith and patience. It takes a lot longer than any of us ever think. But if we stay committed to the task, if we're willing to pick up a shovel and if we're willing to dig, our, our latter days are going to be even greater than our former days. So Hillsong London, Mama Chris is here to encourage you. Come on, it's time. I know we've been locked down. I know it's, we feel dry. I know we feel barren. I know there have been challenges and obstacles and hurdles, but let's be a generation that is going to pick up a shovel, that is going to start digging and let's see the greatest revival spread through our nation than we've ever seen in the history of the church. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that word blessed you this morning. And wherever you've been watching uh, across the United Kingdom, uh, I really hope that stirred something inside you to believe that your best days uh, as individuals, as families, uh, for your businesses, even for us as a church, I really believe they are ahead of us. The, the best days are really ahead. We've been in uh, quarantine now for several days. And so I know our best days as a family are ahead. And honestly, we just can't wait to get out and start meeting you all. And uh, we, we've been praying and really believing that as this next season continues to unfold, that it's going to be God breathed, that he's got something incredible for us. Uh, and what has been over two decades for our church has been something very special. And let's continue to believe that the wells that have been dug and will continue to get uh, dug uh, will just have incredible fruit and impact in the days to come. One of the things that Christine was talking about was you know, our faith and our patience. And I guess one of the, the greatest questions I love to ask people and pray with people about is their faith. And I guess wherever you're watching today, maybe up there in Birmingham, Liverpool, Oxford, or even in Edinburgh, or right across London, I wonder where your faith is. Uh, is it in yourself? Is it in your own abilities? Is it in how you've tried to figure out this last season of, of the world, what it's thrown at you? Or is your faith still absolutely found in Jesus Christ? Is your hope and your trust and your reliance in Him? You know, there's a, uh, we've been in unprecedented times and I think there's no better time to continue to put our faith and our hope in Jesus Christ. And maybe you just tuned in for the first time in a long time or maybe it's you just stumbled across the YouTube linked uh, wherever, you, wherever you're watching this from. And I guess I'm going to pray a prayer uh, to finish off the service. And it's one that says, hey, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, I need you. Oh, I know my life isn't what it should be. I know my, my faith and my trust in you isn't where it should be. I know I've been living life according to my ways. And I don't know about you, but any time I know that where I've made choices according to my own will and my own decisions and my own resources, it makes a mess. But the wonderful thing about Jesus Christ is he comes into our mess, comes into our hopelessness, comes into our faithlessness, and he brings a wonderful forgiveness, a wonderful exchange of of His grace and His goodness for our mess and our mistakes. And so, friend, this morning, wherever you are, I wonder if I could lead you in this prayer. If you're not right with God and you want to be, if you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and begin to connect with Him and follow Him and find out all the wonderful things that He has for your life ahead, then this prayer is for you. And I wonder if you just pray it along with me. And so, come on, why don't you just repeat this prayer after me? Say, Dear Jesus, 
I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. And today, I acknowledge my need of you. Come into my life. I thank you that you forgive me of all of my mistakes. Today, I choose to follow you. Help me to live every day from this moment with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you pray that prayer, there's a whole bunch of ways that we want to help you as a church. Uh, there's a website you can jump into and there'll be a link down there for more details that you can check out. But really, the best thing I can say that if you really wanted to pursue Jesus and follow him and give him your whole heart, then just stay connected. Jump in. There's groups. There's Alpha. There's a whole bunch of ways that we can help you. But just keep going. Uh, we want to send you some things and I pray that you receive that in Jesus' name. So, hey, church, uh, next Sunday. I am going to be speaking right across the UK. I've uh, got a message in my heart that really, I guess, hopefully will, will help first and foremost, but also unpack some of the road ahead for us as a church. And we're in exciting times. We're coming out of lockdown, which is great. And as a church, we want to make some announcements as well about services and locations and how this is going to look because we cannot wait to start meeting together again. So one more time, let me pray for you as we finish the service today. And I thank you, God, for every single person out there. I think that your hand is upon them and I pray a blessing over them and their household and all their endeavors. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that with us and I thank you that you are for us. And I thank you that what has been dug in our, in our lives and in our faith and in our, in our journey with you, Lord God, it is going to produce incredible fruit in our own lives, but also for our church in the days ahead. Thank you that you love us and are with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, church. We're going to see you real soon and uh, incredible, exciting days ahead. Much love.